NASA says it's ready to trust Boeing's Starliner with astronauts again. But after a mission that nearly spun out of control, not everyone shares that faith. The spacecraft that froze its crew in the dark and lost its thrusters in orbit is now being prepared for certification, a move some call bold others reckless. Behind the optimism lies one haunting question. If Starliner failed once in space, how many chances does it get before fate runs out? On November 24th, the quiet hum of NASA's press office broke into a flurry of headlines. The agency had just redrawn its pact with Boeing, an adjustment to the long-troubled Starliner program that once promised a new era of American spaceflight. The revision was stark. Six missions had been whittled down to four, the remaining two still possible though now draped in uncertainty, as promises whispered in a storm. The first of those missions, Starliner 1, will not carry astronauts but cargo. Its launch date no earlier than April 2026. Only after that maiden cargo flight will Boeing attempt the most daring step three crewed flights one at a time each, a test not only of machinery, but of trust. Behind the technical briefings and cautious optimism lies NASA's true mission to certify Starliner as a safe, reliable spacecraft for human spaceflight. Yet the agency's reassurances have not erased the tremors of doubt. For many memories of last summer's ill-fated crewed test flight remain too vivid to forget those long hours when two astronauts found themselves at the mercy of a spacecraft that refused to behave. It's a sobering reality both of Starliner's earlier uncrewed test flights had suffered from thruster malfunctions, and still NASA gave the green light for a crewed mission. What followed was a replay of every engineer's nightmare. The propulsion system, the very heart of the craft, again faltered. Two years of painstaking fixes, simulations, and hope evaporated in a haze of technical confusion. The root cause of the failure. Elusive as ever. The fix incomplete. One might think the story ends there, but the shadows lengthen when politics enters orbit. Officially, space is meant to be above such things, a political pure, a realm of exploration untouched by earthly disputes. Yet when SpaceX's founder Elon Musk revealed he had offered to return the stranded astronauts earlier and claimed the Biden administration declined for political reasons, the line between science and state blurred. NASA and the astronauts themselves denied politics played any role, but the damage to public confidence was done. Still, the astronauts stayed silent, dignified. Commander Butch Wilmore, ever the professional, declined to comment on the political drama out of respect for NASA and the administration. His restraint spoke volumes a quiet act of loyalty in an age of noise. Behind the scenes, their ordeal was more chilling than most realized. Imagine it nine months trapped in orbit, waiting, watching, hoping yet unable to speak the full truth. You endure the fear, the uncertainty, and when you finally return home, you thank everyone, because that's what astronauts do. It wasn't until nearly a year later that the real story began to surface. In April, an Ars Technica report pulled back the curtain on the harrowing moments aboard Starliner. The reactions were visceral. Commenters called it terrifying, a shit show, even the worst possible failure without deaths. One simply wrote Jesus. Now, as Boeing and NASA prepare to try again, the stakes are painfully clear. This is not merely about contracts or cargo. It is about trust, trust in a national space agency, once seen as the steady hand guiding humanity's reach for the stars. Trust in a company whose name once stood as a monument to American aerospace ingenuity. And yet beneath that trust lies an uncomfortable truth. There is no confidence left in a program that has never truly succeeded. We can't forget what Wilmore and Williams said during their interview with Ars Technica back in April. The unease began quietly first in their voices, 
then in their eyes when they spoke of what they would later call the cold night on board. The crew endured it in silence. Starliner was designed for four, but this maiden voyage carried only two, and the absence of extra bodies meant the absence of warmth. By Wilmore's estimate, the cabin dipped to 50 degrees, Fahrenheit perhaps colder. The two astronauts wrapped in their bulky suits and boots floated through the capsule like explorers in a frozen cave, each exhaling, fogging the air between them. Yet the chill in the air was nothing compared to the cold that settled in Wilmore's gut. He couldn't shake the worry about Starliner's 28 reaction control system thrusters, the very engines that kept the spacecraft stable and steerable in orbit. He had raised those concerns long before launch, reminding senior Boeing officials that the same thrusters had failed during unmanned tests. His fear was simple, blunt, and chilling. If we lose thrusters, we could end up in a situation where we can't control space. That moment came sooner than anyone wanted. On day two, as Starliner approached the International Space Station, the mission reached its most delicate phase, docking along the V-bar, the invisible velocity line trailing the orbiting outpost. Every meter mattered, every pulse of a thruster counted. Then suddenly one didn't. A single thruster failed, forcing Wilmore to take manual control. Moments later, a second went dark. Starliner was now down to a single fault tolerance to maintain six of six degrees of freedom forward, chuckle backward, up, down, left, right, yaw, pitch, roll. It is just one layer of redundancy separating order from chaos. The loss of two thrusters violated the mission's flight rules. At this point, they were supposed to abort, turn around, and head home. But home wasn't a simple choice anymore. As the craft edged closer to the station, a third thruster died, then a fourth. The pattern was alarming. They were all aligned in the same direction, two underneath and one along the port side. Wilmore had now lost six degrees of freedom control. The ship couldn't maneuver forward. The controls felt sluggish, like pushing through syrup in zero gravity. That's when the question loomed, one that could decide everything. Go forward or return. Turning back meant relying on the same faulty thrusters to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. But pressing forward risked colliding with the station. Every option was dangerous. Every second stretched thin. We're in a very precarious situation, Wilmore admitted. At one point, he confided a thought no astronaut ever wants to voice. I don't know if we'll be able to get back to Earth. I think we probably won't. Ahead of them, the ISS shimmered against the void so close, so impossibly far. The astronauts agreed their best hope of survival was to dock, seek shelter, and let the ground teams figure out what had gone wrong. In Houston, the room fell silent, except for the hum of consoles. Flight director Ed Van Sees made a fateful decision waive the flight rules. It was a call born of experience, courage, and perhaps desperation. Mission Control became the third crew member that day. To save the mission, engineers needed to restart the failed thrusters. But for that, Wilmore would have to take his hands off the control's relinquish command of a drifting spacecraft in orbit, just hundreds of meters from the ISS. Hands off, he radioed his voice steady but tight. Houston sent the command. The flight computer rebooted. Two thrusters sputtered back to life. Starliner clawed its way back to a single fault state. Then, as if to mock their relief, a fifth thruster failed. The team on the ground tried again, one more restart, one more act of faith. Miraculously, all but one engine returned. It was enough. With cautious optimism, Wilmore handed control back to the automated system. Starliner bruised, but breathing performed its final maneuvers and almost disbelievingly docked. Cheers erupted in Houston. On board, Williams allowed herself a small smile of joy. But beneath that moment of triumph ran a quiet dread this spacecraft had barely made it to port. Wilmore knew it too. As he later put it, I didn't think we could do it. I was hopeful, 
but it was going to be really hard to get to the point where we could say, yeah, we can come back. That night, as Earth rolled beneath them, the two astronauts floated in silence, still wrapped in their suits. The cold had returned, but now it wasn't just the temperature. It was the realization of how close they had come to being stranded among the stars. In the days that followed, the truth began to crystallize, not in the number of thrusters that failed, but in what those failures nearly cost. At first, the headlines were clinical. Four of 28 thrusters lost. A statistic, a fraction, a data point. But buried in the telemetry logs and first-hand accounts was a far more terrifying reality. Starliner had come within reach of total loss of control, six degrees of freedom slipping away one after another, like a pilot's nightmare unfolding in slow motion. Engineers later admitted that the spacecraft's roll and lateral axes were at the brink of collapse. They lost control of six axes, one analyst summarized bluntly, calling the situation horrifying. Behind the restrained technical jargon, one conclusion echoed through engineering circles and comment threads alike. Boeing had really profoundly messed up. But Boeing wasn't alone in the crossfire. NASA, too, found itself under intense scrutiny, not for what happened in orbit, but for what happened afterward. The agency's legendary commitment to openness seemed to falter. Days turned into weeks before the public learned the full extent of the crisis. Questions multiplied. Why did it take so long for NASA to reveal that the astronauts would not return on Starliner? Why were the most severe details buried beneath a tide of vague reassurances and silence? The opacity sparked suspicion. It felt like a cover-up, one industry observer said, like they were trying to sell confidence they didn't actually have. Until now in the hallways of Houston and the hangars of Cape Canaveral, an unspoken question lingers heavy as vacuum. Who would dare climb aboard Starliner now? According to Eric Berger, Ars Technica's senior space reporter, NASA astronaut Luke Delaney, was also in line to train for the Starliner 1 mission at one point, but has been reassigned to the SpaceX Crew 13 mission. There are some astronauts who have trained to fly on Starliner and were reassigned to fly on SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft, who could conceivably be assigned to the Starliner 2 flight, assuming all goes well with this next cargo mission.